Up next, a conversation about social media's impact on the next generation. Please welcome Elsa Majimbo, a comedian and author, Elise Myers, a writer and comedian, and Jean Twangy, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. Here to lead the conversation is Kate Julian, a senior editor with The Atlantic. To add just briefly to the bio you just heard, I want to um, say to those of you who are not on TikTok and Instagram that Elsa um, at the far end here and Elise are superstars. They are people <laughs> with millions of followers. They get recognized in the supermarket and in Starbucks. Um, they were not superstars before the pandemic, which is sort of interesting, and we'll talk about that a bit, but they have both really hit a chord with very unfiltered and honest video content um, about their lives. Jean is, in addition to um, being a professor, one of the first people to ring the alarm bell about the mental health epidemic that is really ravaging youths and young adults today. She's also the author of iGen, and this is a very long subtitle, so bear with me, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious, More Tolerant, Less Happy, and Completely Unprepared for Adulthood. <laughs> if you're thinking that this is an interesting combination of people, you're right. We have somebody who's done really amazing work on the dark side of social media. And I do not get recognized at the supermarket. <laughs> And we have two people who are really like the best of social media, the good side. And we are not going to have a debate today about whether social media is good or bad, because it is good and it is bad. Um, we're going to talk about how it interacts with our mental health in nitty gritty detail. And we're going to talk about sort of what we can do to make that relationship more healthy. So Jean, I'd like to start with you. Could you just give us the really broad overview about what's going on with mental health trends, what we know, and what leads you to think that social media is involved? Yeah, so um, I research generational differences. So I keep, always keep an eye on the big national surveys that are done um, often every year of teenagers and young adults. And in the data coming out around 2012, 2013, there started to be some odd trends, um, some striking trends of more and more teens saying that they felt lonely, that they felt left out, that they felt like they couldn't do anything right, that they didn't enjoy life. And then this kept going. It started to appear in clinical level depression, in emergency room visits for self-harm behaviors like cutting, in um, emergency room visits for suicidal thoughts, for the suicide rate itself. Um, it showed up in happiness and life satisfaction going down after it had been going up for teens for quite a while. And these are really, really large changes. So they, when I first you know, started working on the book on iGen, it was about 2015 and they had been going on for a few years, but then they kept going. So for example, between 2011 and 2019, so before the pandemic, Clinical level depression among 12 to 17 year olds doubled. Self-harm admissions doubled in that age group. Among 10 to 14 year olds, um, girls, it quadrupled. Mm -hmm. The suicide rate doubled. So we're, we're talking about changes that are very large that happen over a very brief, um, relatively brief period of time. So of course that begs the question, why? Why did it happen at this particular time? What was going on in teens' lives that, that might explain this? And at first it was really a mystery to me and everybody else. Um, I puzzled over this for a long time because it didn't line up with economic trends. The US economy was finally starting to improve after the Great Recession in that period around 2012. And it was hard to think of an event that happened at that time, reverberated across the decade, then I realized, coming across some other statistics, that was the time when the majority of Americans started to own a smartphone. It was also the first time that social media use among teens moved from something that was optional that people would do every other week or, some, or maybe a couple times a week to something that the majority were doing every day. And that crossed maybe about 75%. When you're in high school, a very peer-oriented time, that means if you're not doing it, then you're left out. So it really moved from optional to mandatory. So that made me think that there might be a connection here 
between the increasing popularity of social media and how much time teens were spending um, online and on social media and this very alarming rise in mental health issues among teens and later it also showed up among young adults as well. Okay, so there's so much there that I want to unpack and I'm gonna come back to you in a minute to try to sort of talk about like how that might actually happen. Like what are the mechanisms by which phones or social media would be making people unhappy? But first I'd like to bring these two in. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you about, as I said, is, is all the sort of different ways. And we know, I know from my reporting, that one of the things about social media that can make people very unhappy is self-comparison, right? You look at a highly curated, buffed, polished version of somebody else's life, you compare it to your own real life and you feel really shitty, excuse me, um, in comparison. One of the things I think is really interesting about these two ladies and their work is that they are doing sort of the opposite. They're turning that on its head. Um, so maybe Elise, could you start by sort of letting us know, sort of painting a picture of sort of what you think you're trying to do and how it's different um, from sort of the vision that I just presented. Yeah, she got really nervous. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm Elise. That's Actually, a very Elise move, by the way, which is to say, like, I'm feeling nervous. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not supposed to introduce myself here. I did that. My name's Elise. I'm going to do it again. So what I do online, basically, is I wanted to create a space for people where um, it kind of was like the unsocial media, social media, moving away from like the influencer culture where it was very unattainable. It was this like perfect highlight reel and perfect person that like you would never be, but you wanted to follow and try to attain to. And like, I just wanted to make content that made made people feel like they saw themselves in me. And it wasn't just sharing all of the bad stuff or just sharing all the good stuff. It was just sharing everything, and it allowed them to kind of see their life in mine and see all of their imperfections in mine and not in a way that I was like harping on myself where I, I just, it was like self-deprecating. It was just a very honest look at my life um, and it, it opened it up and it allowed people in. And um, yeah, I've just seen so, so much connection in that that I haven't seen in social media in a very long time. And I didn't imagine that like starting with like funny stories would have ever led to this, but it's become something that's like an answer to a problem I didn't know existed really until the end my videos were the answer for some people, which, yeah, it's just, it's been very, very wild, and I'm grateful to kind of be able to do that. If anybody hasn't seen her breakout video, which involves a date that, some, a date who somehow got her to pay for 100 tacos, your first order of business <laughs> after leaving this room should be to watch it. Um, but, you know, Thank it's you striking that you also talk about mental health yeah. explicitly. Can you say a little bit about that and sort of how that's factored in? Yeah, I think, I think that there's a lot of accounts that will be solely focused on mental health, and I always wanted to make it feel normal. So I didn't want it to point out social or mental health in a way that I was, I was like explicitly talking about it. I just, I've always wanted it to feel as normal as like talking about the weather. And I think that as, as much as I can like lace um, anxiety and depression and OCD and panic attacks and, and all of that, as much as I can like casually bring it up, which sounds very jarring to be just be like, yeah, I had pizza for lunch and like, I actually just had a panic attack, but I think today I have a doctor's appointment at three. <laughs> like just to make it feel normal, it, I think that it allows people to not feel as heavy about it when they're talking about it in their life. And um, I think that's a really powerful thing to be able to do in someone's life, to just not make it feel cold and sterile, that it's just, it's just another part of who you are. Elsa, can you sort of do a version of the same thing? Like, could you sort of just introduce people to sort of what you see as your secret sauce? Like, what is it about what you are offering people in your videos that people respond to with such warmth and connection? Maybe even describe a little bit sort of, you know, the first few videos that were really breakouts for you. Um, yeah, I think my videos are very, they're quite honest and open and quite to the point. And when I made the first one, I thought it was absolutely funny. So I just kind of like put it out there and I thought it was really hilarious and I put it and people actually found it funny. So that was great. And because I was talking about my life and things that have happened, people were able to connect because I was talking about things that happens in everyone's lives. but people just kind of neglect speaking about, and I was putting it in a way that we could all connect together. And you know, I would say something and people would be like, oh yeah, me too. So through that, we were able to connect no matter how far we were. 
You know, one of the things that I love about Elsa and Elise's videos is that as lovely and put together as they look right now, they let people see them in their unvarnished everyday states without makeup, without their hair done, um, uh, with a sense of humor. Elsa sort of famously wore, um, do you want to describe your sunglasses? I don't know. She had these really awesome cheap sunglasses oh that she wore. Oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> so basically I have like this, they're broken because when I bought them first, I, 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 was, I was broke, I didn't have money, and they were a dollar, so they cut, broke quite easily, and I wear them, and they're really cool. You have, to, you have to see to feel it, but they're really nice. They're very cool and very funny and just perfect. Um, and so her first videos involved like her sitting there eating chips, literally. I mean, they're the most unfancy, uncurated things, and she tells these kind of, just says these hilarious things early in the pandemic where she's like, Everybody's talking about, oh, I miss you, and oh, I'm so sad that I can't go out in the world. And I mean, I'm doing a bad job of rendering this, but I'm relieved. Oh my God, I can just stay at home and rest. Um, and there's just something very real and authentic about that that I think we, we don't necessarily um, see that much of in other parts of our lives. Um, Dr. Twangy, let's hop back a bit to this question I was sort of alluding to about like how this actually happens. Like if there is a connection between social media use and depression and other mental health issues, like what are the actual mechanisms? You know, and we're all living through this massive real time natural experiment. So we don't actually really have answers. Like we don't have controlled experiments to sort of answer some of these questions. But if you were gonna sort of look at the leading suspects, what would you, what would you suggest? And we, you know, we, we do have controlled experiments on some of the possible mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah. So things like um, if you look at Instagram, as opposed to say a travel site that there's, you tend to feel worse about your body. Uh, it, Facebook's internal research, Meta's internal research found that as well, especially for teen girls that many of them trace their body image issues to um, spending a lot of time on Instagram. Um, there's obviously a lot of focus on trolls and cyberbullying and, and, and all of that. Um, but there's, there's also some things that are you know, arguably even more pervasive across a lot of different platforms. So one is just simple social comparison. That I mean, Instagram's known for this, but it absolutely happens on Facebook too because, you know, you ever notice that everybody else is always on vacation on Facebook? Um, and then everybody always looks so glamorous on Instagram. And what you don't know is that they um, probably took 200 selfies to get exactly the right one, and they may have had a makeup crew. And, you know, there's all, all of these things that are behind the scenes. And even if you know that on an intellectual level, you may not know that on a gut level. And it has an impact that you're comparing your life or your body to what you're seeing on social media, which is not real, which is my fellow panelists have been talking about. Um, but still, it kind of hits you in the, in, in the gut, and that has that impact on, on mental health, um, sometimes mediated through body image and sometimes more directly. And it tends to hit girls and women the most. So that's one factor. Then you know another big one, which um, I did a, a lot of research on, is you think about, well, what, what do people do on social media, online in general? They're often communicating with other people. You know, sometimes people they don't know, but a lot of times communicating with friends. So think about you know, a high school student. If they're communicating a lot um, online with friends, well, how much time is that going to leave for getting together face to face? And it turns out that high school students spend a lot less time getting together with each other face to face. And that trend started around the same time, around 2012, right when social media and smartphones took off. Uh, again, all pre-pandemic, that if there's one survey that's of um, entering college students looking back on their last year of high school, they spent an hour less a day in face to face social interaction with friends compared to uh, Gen Xers when they were in high school in the late 80s. So just a lot less time face to face. Well, the problem with that is that communicating face to face is really good for mental health. Spending a little time on social media, probably not that much of an impact, but if you're spending so much time on social media that that's replacing your interacting face to face with people, that is not a good formula for mental health. Okay, so Elise, I wanna let you jump in there because one of the things I really love about your thing is that you interact 
um, with your viewers as if you are their friend, right? Like people often refer to her as the internet's best friend, and I think it's kind of true. Um, and yet, it's obviously not really a two-way friendship, right? So I'd like you to kind of talk about what it is that you think people can actually get out of that relationship. Yes, yeah. it's not an in-person, offline thing, but clearly there's something going on that's doing quite a bit for people who are watching you. So can you say some more about that? Yeah, I, a lot of my goals in my videos that I make are um, to, to make people feel like known, loved, and that they belong. And um, you know, one question you can ask is like, if you never meet these people, like how do they possibly feel that way? Because it is one-sided. But I think that there has just been so much of my life that I didn't see myself in other people, and I didn't, I, I couldn't relate to somebody the way that like I was feeling, or like the you know the way I was struggling with things. And I can make content where where people do see themselves in me, and they, they can feel known. And um, I think that like to your point, you know, we are you know losing face to face interaction, but. I mean, I'm an introvert, and that literally sounds like the best thing ever. And so I, I'm listening to your points, and I'm like, that doesn't sound bad to me. Like, so I'm really struggling with that, I think. But um, I, I, I understand, and at the same time, I think that social media opens up this place where it's like, for the first time ever, we're also, if people use it like safely and healthily and well, we're getting access to, to viewpoints and to people and to connection that we never, ever would have if it didn't exist. And I know I found a community of people that are like, you know what, you do wake up at four o'clock and you look kind of like hot garbage on the screen, but I love that for you because I'm, I'm, that's me, you know, I'm a mom and I find other moms that just don't have a lot of people that, you know, are, are not put together the way they aren't put together. And um, yeah, I just think it, it can also be very, very healthy and if it's done right, but it isn't a lot of the times, which is where I think a lot of issues come and um, which is what I'm kind of trying to undo with my content. Right. I mean, if we find ourselves in this spot where, for whatever set of reasons, people don't have the same kind of in-person social contacts they used to, is it better to have a lease or is it better to have nothing? I think having a lease is, is kind of an amazing thing. Elsa, I'm, I'm curious, not to put you on the spot, but you are the only person on this stage who is a member of the generation that Dr. Twenge is talking about when she says that there's a mental health crisis. So what do you, as the Gen Z um, uh, representative, think might be going on? I mean, do you buy the idea that social media has, on the balance, been really challenging for people in terms of mental health? Would you push back? Are there other factors that we should be taking into consideration here? Yeah, um, I feel like social media portrays lives that don't exist um, a lot of the times, very glamorous and there's very beautiful people and you know, you just want that life. But you know, most of them are just like fake or people are paying in a very hefty price. It might not be money, it may be something else. And I feel like people want that regardless, even though they know um, it's fake or they know someone did something for it, they still want it. So I do think so, and it's had a very big impact um, on a lot of people's mental health. And for me personally, I think I saw all that. And I knew, because, you know, I was in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and I knew I couldn't, that was quite out of my reach. So the only thing I could do was be myself, because I still wanted to be on social media and on Instagram and still interact with all these people. But not everyone puts themselves in that space. And instead of deciding to be themselves, which is the only thing you can be, because that's the only thing you're sure about, everyone tries to act like someone else. Yeah. Um, we are running a little short on time, so I want to just kick one last question to you, Dr. Twenge. Could you sort of, given the reality that this is the world we live in, mm -hmm. give us some sort of evidence-based suggestions about like sort of simple measures that we could take either as a society, in our own lives, in our children's lives, if we're parents, um, to use social media in a way that sort of is most likely to harvest the good and, and not so much the bad? Mm -hmm. So I have three kids myself. They're 15, 12, and 10. So I think about this a lot in terms of what are we doing in the world to make this a good place for our kids? And I think really it's everything in moderation. 
and to be especially careful with kids and teens. So you're supposed to be 13 to use, to, to use social media, but that age limit is not enforced. I mean, it's probably also too young. These platforms were not designed for young children. So I think we have to have different rules and regulations, whether we're talking about kids uh, or we're talking about adults. But there is one tip that is a great one for everyone of all ages, which is don't have your phone in the bedroom overnight. There's tons of studies on this. You will sleep better. If at all possible, get it out of the bedroom. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking my smartphone is my alarm clock, so I have to have it in my bedroom. I have a tip for you. Buy an alarm clock. <laughs> you can buy it on Amazon on your phone and then put it away and get a good night's sleep. On that very helpful note, we're going to have to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Dr. Twangy, Elsa, Majimbo, Elise Myers. This has been really fun. It's been great. <laughs>